So during that time, when they're criticizing the Bible and finding contradictions, the Christians need to arm, their self, uh, arm themselves and then be able to combat uh, the contradictions supposedly found in the Bible. One of the greatest methods is dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is basically a teaching where it divides the verses where it seems like they contradict each other to the right time period to the right group of people. So not every verse in the Bible will uh, to one group to one time period. So the Lord raised up a man named John Nelson Darby. Now, I've already explained from previous church history and world history class that Darby is not the one who invented dispensationalism. Darby, he became known as the most influential or the so-called father of dispensationalism because he was more known for that. But uh, even at the first centuries, people have taught and believed in dispensationalism. Amen. Now, this is page 319 from Frederick Widowson's book, A Bible Believer's Guide to World History. I'll read as follows. John Nelson Darby, an influential evangelist in the Christian group, the Plymouth Brethren, was born in 1801. Now, he's from the Plymouth Brethren group. Today, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to look at any group that would be close to the Baptist is the Brethren group. Now, you'll notice also Plymouth, right? It, what comes to your mind is the pilgrims, right? Yeah. Remember, because of those pilgrims who were better than the Puritanical, Calvinist, and Anglican church people, uh, what followed the heels of the pilgrim were Baptists, remember? Mm -hmm. Don't forget Roger Williams in your history. Roger Williams, who, uh, because of... I think his charter, or what he started out with the providence of Rhode Island, basically the American Constitution of separation of church and state and the independent mindset, which was so crucial for our culture today, that changed all of history. So what Roger Williams did is because uh, he fled to the pilgrims, you might recall. He was kicked out by uh, the Calvinists and then fled to the pilgrims because they were the better people. Uh, it's because of the pilgrims where they started in America, the Baptists came in. But the Puritans, uh, Calvinists, or Anglican Church, when they came to America, the, the, when they started their uh, homes, it always failed. But the pilgrims was the first place where it really settled in. The pilgrims was the first place where they really settled in. So Baptists are going to follow the heels of uh, the Brethren group pretty close, you're going to find out in history. Now, the Brethren group, they have their doctrine wrong, and we're not Brethren group. We're Baptists. We'll always be that way through history because we want to follow the group that's the closest to right doctrine. So the denomination would be the Baptists. Now, today's Baptist is so messed up, so we're independent Baptists uh, because we take that independent mindset from Roger Williams and our Baptist heritage. But anyway, following along, he was born in London in 1801. He went, on, he went on to become an influential preacher and Bible commentator. He is considered by those who don't agree with dispensationalism, usually followers of what is called covenant theology, as the father of modern dispensationalism, although there were many adherents of that line of thinking all through Christian history without being named as such. Amen. Differing opinions about doctrinal issues within the framework of believing in salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, have characterized the face throughout the centuries. Even the enemies of Darby's premillennial faith and belief in the restoration of Israel and the rapture of the church acknowledge that his Bible commentary, which can be found on the internet, is very useful. So even the enemies of dispensationalism and John Nelson Darby, they'll admit it that his writings are very useful and you can find it on the internet. It is the same with the English Baptist and staunch Calvinist, John Gill, who wrote in the previous century. Even if you don't agree with him on every point, you will find a great deal of helpful commentary in his writings found on crosswalk.com, among other Christian websites. 
So you can look that one up, crosswalk.com. Now, this is very crucial during that time because uh, what Nelson Darby is, is uh, combat, it's combating uh, the textual criticism or the criticism of the Bible that time. Higher criticism, lower criticism, etc. So then it resolves the contra so-called contradictions in the Bible that's being promoted in the universities and the schools. It also combats the immensity and rise of cults that rose that time, remember? Mm -hmm. So the cults rose immensely that time with uh, Jehovah Witnesses, uh, Mormonism, the Church of Christ, which is from uh, Campbell, and then et cetera and et cetera. Uh, the Unitarian Church and all that. So this, so God timed it pretty much right, and he came during the time of the Great Awakening Revivals. The Great Awakening Revivals was crucial, where it changed the spiritual lives of the Americans. But now they need to be armed with knowledge, because knowledge is increasing through the human philosophy and the Catholic textual criticism that was, uh, that was infesting the other churches and universities now. So knowledge had to be used by uh, God's people to combat the knowledge of the wickedness of the world. Okay, so that's why Nelson Darby's, the timing of it was no coincidence. It's definitely of God. He planned it all along. As the rise of uh, the devil's men was infecting the world. Now. Never forget your enemy, right? Never forget your enemy. So uh, the Catholic Church, they're not done. They're not done with business. This is on page 323. Uh, let me move over here. This is on page 323 in Whittleson's book. During this time, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, which had been suppressed by Pope Clement XIV in 1773, were reinstated by Pope Pius VII in 1814. So remember the Jesuits, they've been uh, exiled during this whole time. And now they, after Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, fall, the Jesuits suddenly get reinstated. You wonder why, right? Mm -hmm. You wonder why. So something happened there. I've discussed about the conspiracies behind it. So it's very possible the Jesuits uh, instigated everything. But anyway, Pope Pius reinstated them. Their success in derailing the Reformation is attested to by their establishment of many Jesuit colleges and universities in which many Protestant scholars and personalities like Norman Geisler and Bob Jones IV have been indoctrinated. Now, if you recall, uh, the Jesuits, they've been infesting the universities and colleges. So they succeeded. So through France, France was totally pagan, so the Jesuits went there first, obviously, but then it infested Germany. So Germany, the heart of the Reformation, fell apart, thanks to the Jesuits. Now they're hitting toward England. But England, because of its um, heritage with the King James Bible and the Great Awakening revivals, it's still uh, strong. It's still very strong. But the Catholics are making ways there, and they're doing the same thing in America. So they're not done. The Catholics are still trying to uh, destroy the godly heritage. In 1846, the longest reigning pope in Roman Catholic history, Pope Pius IX, now I'm on 324 page, he, Pope Pius IX took control. His reign, called a pontificate, lasted from 1846 to 1878. During his time, the papacy lost its control over what was called the Papal States and called the First Vatican Council. He established the Catholic dogma of the Immaculate Conception of Mary and that she was free from the stain of original sin, so was sinless like the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, that's wrong. This heresy was added to the dogma of papal infallibility he established, formally that stated that the Pope was incapable of error. Well, ha ha, laugh. In the political realm, he fought against anti-Catholic laws, in many heavily Catholic countries. And according to General Thomas Harris of the committee that investigated the assassination of President Lincoln in his book, Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, and Charles Chiniqui in his 50 years in the Church of Rome, he oversaw the flooding of the United States with immigrants from poor Roman Catholic countries 
in a strategy of taking control of this country and derailing the intents of the founding fathers. Okay, so that's a lot to unpack over here. So this Pope, uh, let's see right here, Pope Pius IX, a lot of uh, Catholic power was uh, taking place. So first of all, the Catholics are making a comeback now. They're getting back to the public game. First of all, Jesuits have been uh, reinstated now in Europe. So we see right here, this is, uh, take, this is uh, the Catholics in the underworld, what they're instigating, what they've been plotting. So this is in post-Napoleon time. And then we've heard a little bit about the history. The Jesuits have been reinstated. Then we hear about Pope Pius IX. Now this guy, he's been working very hard where the Catholics can make a comeback. Pope Pius IX, he uh, sent out two heresies and the Pope being infallible, basically the Pope is incapable of error. So whatever the Pope says, then you have to follow it, right? So that enslaves the people. Why? Because remember, independence is now spreading everywhere. Uh, what the Baptist heritage mindset did is spread the independence. Even the lost world is becoming independent. So that independent, uh, the, don't forget France, right? Because they were following the independent mindset, but it's based on atheism, which is why it's turning into socialism, communism, and it's so messed up now. But in America, they still had a biblical morality combined with the independence. That's why they were successful, uh, unlike France. So the Pope, he had to get to work to try to get, uh, because this is not the Dark Ages, the Holy Roman Empire now. So supposedly it's been gone by Napoleon, but like Dr. Ruppman uh, stated, and I've shown you from the book, Rome always is a chameleon, they'll change their powers. Yeah. So whatever is not public, they'll do it through private means, and what they did in public means was through diplomatic relations, even though they can't do it through dictatorship, okay? So the Catholic power remained, but the Pope, he's trying to scramble it all together, because the Holy Roman Empire lost its um, supposedly its control. So Pope being infallible, papal infallibility would do the job. That will enslave the minds of the people. Also, the remember what Thomas Jefferson said, right? A long time ago, and I told you about the immigrants coming in. They, he warned that they're going to bring their uh, Catholic nonsense their ideology into America and they'll change what we worked so hard to create this uh, biblical, moral, independent nation. And it turned out to be true, Pope Pius IX, he's flooding America with so many Catholic immigrants that it changed the landscape. Maryland and Delaware were declared to be uh, Catholic states actually, or uh, it was dominated by Catholic influence, either or. So here's, and then, let's continue reading on. General Harris goes on to accuse uh, this pope and his church in his 1897 book of the assassination of early 19th century presidents, Harrison and Taylor, believe it or not. And this guy who claimed that General Harris is a highly respected military person of the 19th century, was not attacked so much for his accusations as he was ignored after creating a small stir. Many other authors had come out with the same statements. Wow. And it is difficult to say if they all were arrived at by independent study or from the same sources. It is, it is acknowledged by all that President Lincoln was mystified at the Pope's acknowledgement of the legitimacy of Confederate President Jefferson Davis as a sovereign leader of a country after the Battle of Gettysburg, which resulted in a high desertion rate for formerly loyal Irish Catholic troops. The United States had been dedicated to the Virgin Mary in Baltimore, in Baltimore in 1846 as well. Wow, you talk about declaring war almost, right? Or something like that. So the Pope declares the United States as Catholic in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So there's no doubt the Catholic Church, they're not done. They're not done. America has always remained the enemy. 
and they're trying to uh, destroy America. Now, I've given you already a lot of nuggets where you heard about the Confederate states lining up and Lincoln being assassinated, and it seems like it smells Catholic conspiracy, and you're like, <laughs> whoa, whoa, that's a lot. So um, I'm going to tell you one by one about what happened, actually. But remember, those uh, Catholic conspiracies have always continued on, which it, it, they were not done. Uh, our enemy is not done. So the Civil War, you can say that the Catholics, they did get involved. And what better way to destroy uh, a country that has been a thorn on the side with Catholic or the Holy Roman Empire than where it divides itself? If you, it's very interesting, but if you uh, look up uh, any website about the Catholics, they'll admit that there were many Catholic soldiers on both sides. Both sides. Why? Due to the immigration. So, already, so then already the Catholics had a strong hold on America at that time. Now the issue, now we come to the controversial issue, okay? So the controversial issue that you can guess in the Civil War was slavery, okay? So I'm, I've, got to lot, I've got a lot to say over here. This is probably the most controversial or one of the most controversial topic in, uh, in our world history. It is still debated to this day, actually. It is still debated to this day. And there are Bible believers, just like the American Revolution, that I'm going to tell you that are, you know, for this side, that side, and then, you know, either or, all right? Now, me, you know your pastor, I'm going to give you the entire information, all right? I'm going to give you the entire information, and I'm going to do it in a balanced way as best as I can. <laughs> so I'm going to give you, uh, first of all, the history on slavery, okay? Uh, page 318 of Widowson's book. The issue of slavery came to the forefront in Europe's drive to end the outrage. In America, the issue also became one that threatened to tear the new republic apart. From the beginning <coughs> of the formation of the USA, there were elements who were not wholeheartedly in agreement with the Union, the Constitution, or the power of the federal government, preferring to retain most of the political power in the state governments. First, with regard to trade tariffs, the desire to uphold a right of nullification, whereby an individual state could nullify a federal law within its own borders that it felt threatened its own sovereignty. Then slavery became an issue when the great abolitionist movement began to take root in America following its success in England. Slavery became known in the southern United States as that, quote, peculiar institution, and many clung to the right to own slaves as a foundation of their freedom, and for a period of at least 40 years before the American Civil War expressed their willingness to abandon the Union of the United States for it. There was, however, a particularly Christian groundswell against slavery, which became much more a profitable practice after Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, which removed the seeds from cotton. Until its invention around 1793, removing those seeds was very labor-intensive. After its invention, the slavery system in the United States was much more sustainable, and the slaves' use in the harvesting of cotton was much more efficient. Many preachers preached sermons against the institution of slavery. Among these were John Wesley's 1774 sermon entitled Thoughts Upon Slavery, and you can find it free online, supposedly, Widowson says which credits its rebirth after a long period of relative unimportance in most of the world to the discovery of America. Now, there are two crucial things that you want to hear about the Civil War, which is heavily debated. But scholars will agree that these are the two. So nearly all scholars all right, and preachers will agree that these are the two crucial issues. These are the two crucial issues that uh, erupted the Civil War. It's union uh, so uh, it's basically the preservation of the Union. So that's federal power. Now, when you hear that already, if you're a Bible believer, your blood turned cold, right? You know, so you're like, uh, uh, so federal power. So that's not good. All right. Now, obviously, that's the North. So what they're thinking is basically that uh, in their mindset that the government should have more power, preservation of the Union. 
the state shouldn't be so divided. We should unite together and uh, that way we can become powerful together. But if you're a Bible believer already, that screams red flag. Yeah. That sounds like New World Order, right. right? Now, I'll explain that part later. So basically, it's a preservation of the union versus the states retaining their own sovereignty or their own power. Exactly. Now, already, you're like, well, that's the good thing if you're a Bible believer. Yeah. Because remember, during the early days of America, when the Great, Re uh, Great Awakening Revival spread out at the beginning, the reason why those Anglican church people or the uh, puritanical Calvinists weren't able to persecute every Christian out there was because they were so divided and scattered. Independent. Independent is so important yes. that independence prevents that uh, government control, so to speak. Right. Amen, right. See that? All right, so uh, you can argue either or, all right? Uh, that this is a good thing and this is a good thing. It doesn't matter. But the point is what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. If you have a lot of faith in humanity, this sounds good. See that? Yeah, yeah. But if you don't have faith in humanity, you have skepticism, this is better for you because you're like protecting yourself, okay? But that was the issue, okay, is one. The other one is slavery. And obviously that is the hot topic that's been screamed out. So slavery... And then uh, the state sovereignty versus the preservation of the union is the hot debate. Now, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. All right, Ephesians chapter 6. Now, you're going to hear liberal professors trying to use the Bible and then uh, tell you that, well, notice that the Bible here condones slavery. So because the Bible condones slavery, I don't like that. So I'm going to, this is going to be very heavy, okay? I'm going to explain every single part thoroughly in the Bible about slavery and also the Civil War, all right? So I think my, ox my oxygen is back, okay? If I'm thinking really hard, I think I, I feel better. So anyway, so, okay, so I don't know. All right, so, okay, now they're going to use Old Testament passages where the Lord allowed slaves, okay? They're going to uh, use these passages to prove that the Bible condones slavery. But, however, you have to understand this, okay? One thing that they fail to realize about slavery in the Bible is, one, uh, if, if you look in the Bible, the Bible, con uh, the Bible condemns kidnapping people and using them for slaves. So notice that the Bible condemns that. All right, but then why is slavery allowed in the Bible, right? even to the book of Ephesians. The reason why is because that was the culture of that time. Just like uh, we would disagree with polygamy during the time of the Old Testament. Just like taxes that we disagreed in the Old Testament and New Testament, okay? What we have to understand is that what God doesn't do, God doesn't tend to break down, uh, uh, ruin the the society's culture on the way they run things. All right, the Lord doesn't believe in rebellion against that. Yeah. That's why the uh, Bible believers don't really get involved in politics. You notice that? Yeah. We only get involved in political issues where it contradicts the Bible. Okay, if it contradicts the Bible, sorry, you know, uh, we stand by the Bible, uh, right. not by your political belief. But everything else, we just don't get really involved. We don't really get involved in those areas. Why? Because the Lord doesn't get involved in those areas. Uh, when there's that uh, tax issue coming out, Jesus Christ, uh, he doesn't get involved in the political debate. The Pharisees, Sadducees try to get him to get into a political debate. But Jesus Christ spoke very cleverly, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the God the things that are God's. So he got away from that. But you notice right here, Jesus Christ does not get in involved in political uprisings Amen. or rebellions. So because of that, whatever the, uh, the way that the institution runs, even if God doesn't like it and people don't like it, uh, the Lord lets it be. Right. In Matthew 19, God didn't like the polygamy, uh, but he allowed it because of the hardness of man's heart, the Bible says, because that was their culture. God didn't want Israel to have a king. But because that culture really wanted a king for their politics, the Lord allowed them to have it. Um, 
Uh, there's just a lot. Jesus Christ was not for taxes. Uh, when Peter was told by the Roman soldiers that he had to pay the taxes, Jesus Christ actually wasn't for it. He said, who pays the taxes, the strangers or the children? Yeah. And then obviously the strangers, and then Jesus said, then the children are free, meaning that we're the strangers, we're the unlucky guys, we have to pay Caesar. And Jesus said, nevertheless, lest we offend them, let's uh, pay them. So that's God's mindset, okay? Now, if the liberals scream about, well, I just disagree with the politics and the culture of that time, well, the thing is this, is that, well, if you were there at that time period, they would think you're stupid too. Yeah. And if they were in your time period, they would accuse you of being stupid, yeah. and there would be anarchy and wars, okay? So, notice that God, he, uh, God, he is sensible. So God's like, you know, mankind is stupid. Yeah, they all fight each other on cultural differences, political differences. I have nothing to do with that one. Why? Because man at his best state is altogether vanity, and because of man's differences, there's always wars. All right? So God doesn't get involved in that. Unless it's sin, unless it contradicts his word, then he'll get involved. Okay? Also, if you uh, read the passage, the Bible forbids uh, mistreatment of slaves. If you look at uh, Numbers and Leviticus. So when he allows slavery, he does not condone mistreatment of slaves or abuses. As a matter of fact, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't condone mistreatment of immigrants either. You're supposed to treat them well. Okay? So uh, the people don't read the Bible. So we see right here in Ephesians 6, in verse uh, 5, so slavery was rampant this time, obviously, during Paul's time. And Paul, he says in Ephesians 6, 6, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Look at verse 8. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be what? Bond or free. So notice right here, this is no doubt talking about slaves. God, he never told the slaves to have an uprising or to do their own thing. He actually said to submit to the master. You might say, well, I don't like that. Well, the thing is, that was the culture and the institution of that time. So because of that, just like taxes, right, that God doesn't like either, God says, you know, the point is, we are to be good citizens in that society. Good testimony of that. That's right. Amen. All right. So that's why we do that. I don't like the way the government runs things right now either. But we have to show them that we are good citizens. And Amen. that's what God requires from us. Amen. So that's why during that time period, uh, when, slavery was, uh, when slavery was coming out, you don't blame the Bible for that one. Okay? You don't blame the Bible for that one. If you follow the Bible's way of doing things, to be honest, there wouldn't have been a civil war. There wouldn't have been a civil war if they followed the biblical way of doing things. But you know what caused the civil war is mankind's uh, own way of doing things. Right. War always results from mankind's uh, own way of doing things. Always does. All right. Now to talk about the secession versus the abolition. Okay. So the secession of the states to be away from the union uh, versus the abolition of slavery right here. Okay, so the argument goes is that uh, why did we have the Civil War? And the debate is, well, it's not because of slavery, it's because the states want to be free from the Union. <coughs> Whereas other people will say, <coughs> no, it's because of slavery. So either or, I don't care. Okay, either or, I don't care. But let me uh, side, uh, let me go this way, okay? Let me go to the side of, let's even pretend that it had to do with slavery, okay? Even if it had to do with slavery, to be honest, you can't really think that the Northern people or Abraham Lincoln, that uh, the reason why they did the Civil War was because uh, they cared about black slaves and they wanted to give freedom and equality to them. To be honest, no, that was not the case. If you look at Abraham uh, Lincoln's life, it is true he might have had, okay, to give the benefit of, uh, uh, let's even say this, okay, to the critics. Let's even say 
that uh, Lincoln, he had more empathy for the black slaves. But if you read his life, you'll see that it's not as empathetic as you think. Uh, this is from, I'm reading from mainstream sources, okay? This is from the History Channel. Five things you may not know about Abraham Lincoln, slavery and emancipation. All right, so he actually, uh, he didn't believe black people should have the same rights as white people. So he actually didn't believe in that one. That's a shock number one, all right? As a matter of fact, let's see right here. He said, uh, another one, number three, Lincoln thought, colonization could resolve the issue of slavery. So what, he, so what he meant by that was, Lincoln first publicly advocated for colonization in 1852, and in 1854 said that his first instinct would be to free all the slaves, oh yay, and then send them to Liberia. End of quote. <laughs> That's what Lincoln actually believed in. He actually wasn't a fan of... Um, uh, integration, actually. Right. He believed that they all should be separated from them after they were freed. The Emancipation Proclamation was not done because of humanitarian effort. It was because of a military policy. Now, if you read this article combined with, uh, and I'm reading from uh, mainstream news sources that liberals would read too, okay? This is from PBS News as well, the Civil War and Emancipation. You know why it was done? It was done because during that time, the Southern, uh, there were slaves who were, uh, who were enslaved to their masters in the South, and they were helping them in the Civil War. So because of that, Lincoln, he had a problem. He had a problem where there were slaves who left the Southern states, and then they went to the Union area. But then because they were in the Union area, what is he going to do with these slaves? unless they are considered free, so to speak, right? Then they can join the military, and then he'll have more people. You know what that's the mindset of? A Democrat politician. Trying to meet minority people, and then saying, you know, I'm gonna give you a benefit benefit, and then minorities are like, oh, that's wonderful. Then they become suckers where they uh, you, uh, build up the power of that politician, that leader. See, the New World Order and this uh, Antichrist government is one of the greatest propaganda ever to uh, use the disguise of, hey, we're trying to give equality and benefits for all races. No, they want more numbers. They want more votes. They want, you, you see, People are dumb. Basically, if you give them candy, but uh, you're gonna, but you have a, you have an agenda in your mind. I'm gonna use you for something. People are gonna grab that candy. You know what? Uh, you know what stalkers, dangerous strangers do? They offer candy to children, and then children, because they don't have that mature mindset, they're thinking only about themselves. Then they grab the candy, and the stranger can use them for something. That's the world. They're all baby mentality, immature mentality, thinking about me, 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 and then the dark stranger out there is just using you like a puppet on a string, okay? So, no, people never learn from history. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Amen. All right, so you have to understand that. You have to understand that. Now, I'm thinking from the mindset, if I'm going to give the best, I'm giving the best benefit of the doubt to the liberal side, all right? Even if I'm going to, at best for them, you have to realize this. The best you can give is Lincoln had a little bit more empathy for the black slaves and other people, but what you're going to find out still at best, even with that little empathy, he still did not, uh, he still did not have that mindset of what the liberals think of equality for blacks and whites. Right. He never had that in mind, and yeah, he wanted to use them. He used them where it benefited his power, his government. Okay? So it'll never change that fact. It'll never change that fact. So you can read those two articles, and they will admit that. They will admit that right there. Let's see right here. So... 
coming back to secession versus abolition. Then we come to the man Lincoln himself, and we find out that from his quotes, as a matter of fact, actually, I forgot to mention from these two articles. Originally, you have to realize that according to these articles, uh, let me read some things right here from PBS News articles. In his inaugural address delivered on March 4th, 1861, Lincoln proclaimed that it was his duty to maintain the Union. He also declared that he had no intention of ending slavery where it existed or of repealing the fugitive slave law, a position that horrified African Americans and their white allies. Lincoln's statement however, did not satisfy the Confederacy, and on April 12th, they attacked Fort Sumter, a federal stronghold in Charleston, South Carolina. Federal troops returned the fire. The Civil War had begun. So yeah, uh, originally, you realize right here that when they started the Civil War, Lincoln, he tried to say, look, this is not done to uh, get rid of slavery. It's just to preserve the Union. Confederates weren't satisfied. They were so upset about that. Civil War happened. But then what happened was, this was the beginning, you have to realize. The beginning was preservation of Union and then the, uh, the state's own rights. But then it soon turned to slavery, okay? Now, I'm speaking from the liberal point of view, actually. The liberal will say slavery was the main issue. But here's the whole story that you're not hearing, all right? The whole story, even according to the liberal perspective, is this is how it started, okay? This is how it started. Then this became the primary issues. It is true that this was debated and discussed at the beginning, but like I read from that article, Lincoln declared that, hey, my intention is not to end slavery, but just preservation of union. So this was the beginning, and then this became the dominant point later. Why was this the dominant point? Because what happens is, then if you argue abolition of slavery, who gets the most power? North. Yeah. Then who weakens in power? The South. Yeah. Okay. That's what happens. So then the South, they start to lose it. That's why this had to become a main issue. Plus, it's going to uh, appeal the populace. It's going to appeal the populace that time. So that's why this was a very uh, clever means, actually. It was a very clever means. Now, to this day, if you argue equal rights, that can be used as an excuse to uh, control people. You can use that to control people, unfortunately. Okay, uh, the next one right here. If you look up Lincoln as well, there's just a, a lot of controversy uh, with Lincoln. But even when he was uh, arguing in his uh, debates or in his votes, uh, let's see right here. Uh, he made his position in a fourth debate at Charleston, Illinois. I'm reading from the History Channel's article. I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the wh white and black races. That's what he actually said in his fourth debate. He also said the N-word if you look at some of his quotes actually. So uh, you have to realize that uh, racism was everywhere in the culture. All right, It was everywhere in the culture that time. All right, Why? Because racism was not just in America. Racism was in Asia was in Africa, was in America, was in South America. Everybody used racial slang on each other that time. Why? Because everybody was a racist that time. <laughs> Big, bad, white American Protestants. No, they were just going by the culture of that time. The culture of that time was everybody was a racist. <laughs> okay? Uh, people nowadays. Okay. They just don't use common sense from history. Now, Next one is the Southern abuses. Uh, it is true that during that time, there were uh, black slaves who were abused by Southern masters. But what they won't tell you also is that there's a really good diaries and books and even Hollywood movies that came out. Uh, I, it's called Gods and Generals. 
And then they had one called uh, Gettysburg, I think, Battle of Gettysburg. But if you uh, read the diaries and the books, what you're going to find out is that basically, remember, the heritage of this time in America, okay, is that it was filled with godliness from the Great Awakening revivals. So you got to realize both so South and North had a lot of godly generals and people, godly people. So you can complain about the racism of that time, but you can complain about the racism in Catholic Europe, in Africa, and pagan Asia, all right? Yeah. Everyone had that, all right? The point is, even though the whole world was racist, if you want to find the most godly terrain, God forbid, but you wouldn't believe it, it's in the South and the North, okay, of America, because of the Great Awakening revivals. Yeah. So during that time, obviously with that Christian mindset, what they won't tell you is that the Southern masters, they did treat their slaves well. They act, do you know what, uh, how the blacks uh, suffered the most? It was after the Civil War. It was after the Civil War because they were used with the masters taking care of them that time. Because the masters had to take care of their servants that time, obviously. So they won't tell you that part, okay? So then, during that time, the, there were masters who treated their slaves well. So, of course, there were masters who abused the slaves. Well, you're going to get that, all right? You're going to find a bad apple somewhere. You're going to find a bad Baptist among a bunch of uh, good Baptists, okay? So, but you're going to find the same in Catholic countries, in pagan countries, in voodoo countries, and in Buddhist countries, okay? So la-di-da, all right? America was still at its best that time, whether you like it or not. Uh, the northern countries, believe it or not, they won't tell you this, they were the ships who took the slaves from Africa to America. They won't tell you that part. Ulysses S. Grant, he had slaves. That's the northern Union general. Robert E. Lee, southern general, freed his slaves. Okay, they won't tell you that part, okay? So after the Emancipation Proclamation as well, that didn't really, uh, uh, what happened was there were still slaves that time. You know that? In both countries. They won't tell you that. Uh, the liberal propaganda, okay, the liberal machine is not giving you a very clear picture. Okie dokie. Oh, they also won't tell you that it was uh, that the in Africa that th those people were selling their own people as slaves and kidnapping them, putting them on northern ships, the Yankee ships, and then they sailed them off to America. And then the southern masters, they bought them. All right. They won't tell you that. You know, uh, in history, the winners are the winners and the losers are the losers. Once you're the loser in history, you get all the scapegoat and blame. All right. Okie dokie. Now let's talk about uh, the interesting part. The interesting part is this. The Catholic Church, they knew they wanted to uh, see America as their primary target, number one still, and destroy it. You know who the Catholics sided with, which is what shocked Lincoln. They uh, sided with the Catholic Confederacy. They sided with the Confederates. Now, why they did that, I don't know, but there are some clues, actually. There are some clues which are very interesting, okay? It's the same thing with JFK and other presidents that I see. But basically, JFK, he's Catholic, right? So you wouldn't see him as a threat. But when he said, I crushed the CIA into a thousand pieces, right? Lincoln, uh, let's see right here. Lincoln, he, de he was a lawyer for a Catholic priest named Charles Tanicki. Now, there's a book or a comic book. Comic book from Jack Chick is called The Big Betrayal, okay? Highly recommend, highly recommend. And then his book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, is better. Charles Chinicki was a Catholic priest. And then, but what happened was he saw the corruption of the Catholic Church. He later uh, preached against the Catholic Church and became a saved Christian. Amen. This was many years later. 
But Charles Chenickney during that time, um, there were fellow Catholic priests uh, who hated him because Chenickney was exposing the corruptions of the Catholic priest. Now, Chenickney was still a Catholic that time. His lawyer who defended him, you wouldn't believe, was Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Lincoln was his lawyer. When Chenickney was able to not be found guilty and get away with it, and then the Catholic priest uh, couldn't uh, frame Chenickney, supposedly there were several Jesuit priests there who watched the whole scenery and they were not happy. The Jesuit priests weren't happy, so Lincoln already became a target at the beginning. Lincoln, uh, he knew the Catholic powers yeah. that time. That could be the reason why the Catholic Church sided with the South. Also, uh, Dr. Upman, uh, uh, he, he said this when I was sitting in his church history class, which was funny, and he mentioned it in his church history book too, that the Catholics uh, sided with the South. Uh, Dr. Upman, because he's from the South, obviously he likes his Southern heritage, but he says, yeah, I'll tell you why the Catholics sided with the South. It's because the South was winning at the beginning that time, you know? Mm -hmm. But there is an element of truth what he's saying. Catholics, uh, they're clever, clever, diabolical beings. What they're going to do is that they will play sides with any side of the coin. In the Civil War, both countries was, had Catholic soldiers, all right, Union and Confederate. In World War II, you're going to find the interesting thing. Catholic was on uh, Adolf Hitler's side, but also you found Catholics helping out the Allied powers. All right, but Catholics, they're very clever people. You know how you win the game? You don't pick a side, okay? Yeah. You, you, you have a backup plan for both sides. So that's how they did things. But Lincoln was, so then they had, they had some backup plans. But uh, officially, the Pope recognized the Confederates. That's what you're going to find out. As a matter of fact, this is very, I was very shocked. You know where I got uh, the information from? The Catholics themselves, they admit that. Catholics themselves will admit that uh, the Catholic powers, how there was a lot siding with the, uh, with the Confederate states. Would you believe that? <laughs> this is from the Catholic World Report article. Title of the article, The Little Known and Often Surprising History of Catholic Confederates. I was, yeah, I was very shocked, but there was a, uh, if you read that article, there was a lot where they mentioned about uh, the Pope. He was uh, siding with uh, Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis, he's the president of the Confederates. And then the Pope recognized uh, his power. I read Widowson's book, right? Lincoln was mystified when the Pope declared uh, Pope Jefferson Davis, right? So there was, there was strange Catholic uh, backing with the Confederate uh, nations that time. That is no mystery. And this is what Abraham Lincoln said about the Catholics, which, uh, was, which is pretty surprising. He said this quote. This is from an old book, and the book is titled Abraham Lincoln's Vow Against the Catholic Church, 1928. The author is M.H. Wilcoxon. Lincoln gave this warning. I do not pretend to be a prophet, but though not a prophet, I see a very dark cloud on our horizon. That dark cloud is coming from Rome. It is filled with tears of blood. It will rise and increase till its flank will be torn by a flash of lightning followed by a fearful peal of thunder. Then a cyclone such as the world has never seen will pass over the country, spreading ruin and desolation from north to south. After it is over, there will be long days of peace and prosperity. For popery with its Jesuits and merciless inquisition will have been forever swept away from our country. Neither I nor you, but our children We'll see these things. That's page 715, 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinicki. You wonder why he got assassinated yeah. by a Catholic. Yeah. All right, but anyway, 
Uh, I'll read some of those parts later, okay? I'll read some of those parts later. Uh, let's see right here. So you obviously know what happened. Uh, the Union won the Civil War. When they won the Civil War, then uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, he got killed. He got, uh, he got assassinated. And then there, were, there was no doubt Catholic conspirators involved, okay? So I'm going to give you a uh, list of names here. Uh, I think I should still have it. There's a list of names of the Catholic conspirators listed. This is from, you want to believe it, this is from Catholic.org, okay? This is from Catholic.org. They admit this. The title of their article is, Did the Catholic Church assassinate President Lincoln? Did Catholics conspire to assassinate Abraham Lincoln? According to National Catholic Register, and the facts themselves, yes, they did. But how did they get around that? They're not stupid. But it was not the Catholic Church themselves. It was just radical Catholics. Yeah, <laughs> you can catch them red-handed on a fact. They have a way to slide their way around it. That, that is a snake, all right? That is a snake. The Catholic Church has always done that. The Vatican has always done that. CDC, the government, has always done that. You can catch them red-handed on the fact, they will always slide away. All right. So, who were Catholics? John Wykes Booth was John Wykes Booth, Catholic. They say right here, John Wykes Booth was a convert to Catholicism. Booth, as most know, was Lincoln's assassin. Mary Surratt who ran the boarding house where the conspirators met, was also Catholic. Now, I'm not reading from Jack Chick, okay? I'm not reading from Jack Chick's comic. He lists all those names too, actually. Uh, her son later evaded capture for a time by fleeing to Canada and taking refuge in a Catholic church. He subsequently fled to Rome and became a soldier tasked with defending the Papal States. Would you believe it? Would you believe that? The NCR reports another one of the assassins was David Harold. Okay, David Harold. David Harold was, guess what? Catholic. <laughs> Catholic. Uh, he studied at Catholic colleges, and Dr. Mudd, who set Booth's leg, because Booth, when he uh, uh, killed Abraham Lincoln, he jumped off the stage, and then uh, he injured his leg. So Dr. Mudd was the one who fixed Booth's leg. Guess what he was? Catholic. Now, I'm reading from you, Catholic.org, okay? <laughs> Would you believe that? Several Catholic priests also testified at the tribunals in May and June 1865. So, what role did Catholicism play in Lincoln assassination? Apparently not enough. You see, blah, 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 blah. How about that? How about that? So they give this excuse that the Catholic Church, you know, denied that, oh, we had no part in Lincoln's assassination. Of course they're going to say that, stupid. You think they're going to say, yeah, we hired Booth to kill your president. They're not going to say that. Of course they're going to deny it. Silly people, man. So that's their excuse that the Catholic Church wasn't involved. Why? Because they denied it. <laughs> You're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. So <laughs> now you see right here that the Catholic uh, anti-church history always followed along. Always followed along. Now, remember I read from uh, Frederick Widowson. A general uh, cried out that the Catholic or the Pope, that the Catholic Empire, the Vatican, were the one who did all of this to assassinate Lincoln and everything. So 
it's very telling about anti-church history. So you got the full scoop now of what's going on. You got the full scoop of now what's going on. So this is uh, what happened in America now was this. What happened is the Catholics were able to find a leeway in, uh, and they always tried to find a leeway, right? You see it right here. You see it right here. You see it right here. They always try to find a leeway in. But a huge change in America has happened. The problem with the Civil War is not that... Uh, the problem with the Civil War is, well, boo, the slaves got freed. No, that's not the issue right here. The issue and the problem is that now the federal power has everything. So the independence, the start of the independence being lost was right here, the Civil War. This changed our American history, all right? Now, obviously, I want the slaves to be free as much as you do, obviously. But the problem is that the federal powers, now it has complete control. It has complete control. So thus began now the downfall. Because remember, Marx was coming, uh, was pervasive with his socialism now. America still has a godly heritage. So let's consider it this way. Let's consider it this way that because there's still a godly heritage, America is still safe. And it's in a union uh, it's in a union preservation of a godly heritage. Fine, but how long will that last, right? According to a Calvinist mindset who wants preservation of the union as well, you notice that it always landed in a mess. Yeah. Church and state should never be combined. It always had to be separated. Independence is so necessary because you cannot trust humans, all right? Lincoln, if we were going to say that he's a very good Christian man, Chinicki, he... Uh, admired the man. I think Chinicki saw him as a saved Christian. He could be, I don't know. But even giving the benefit of the doubt of Lincoln being a good man, the thing is this, is that you might have a good man who might rule over the entire country with the federal, uh, with the preservation of the union, but how long will that last, right? You just shoot the guy dead and you can try to put somebody else who may not be so much as good to take over. There's a reason why they shot him dead, okay? There's a reason why they shot him dead. Okay, but, uh, anyways, uh, we're going to see what happens to England, all right, during that time. America still is prosperous, all right? But you can see how the Catholic and socialism evolution and apostasy is really tearing it apart bit by bit. But remember, the Great Awakening revivals are not done. So the Great Awakening revivals continue to save America. No matter how many times the Catholic conspiracies, the cults, the devil tries to put holes into the country. So the Great Awakening revivals continue to save America. But how long will it last? Right? That's one. Number two, the institutions are spreading their heresy further. Three, two bad boys are going to come real soon. And they destroyed the Bible. That ruined all the preachers from the Great Awakening revivals. England and America became very powerful, and England is about to hit its most prosperous time, Victoria. But at the same time, there's something dark behind the scenes where people hear about CFR, Bilderbergers, Trilateral Commission, Chase, Rothschilds coming out, the round table under Cecil Rhodes. All right, next time in our history. Father God, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to our hearers and that it's been very eye-opening, very sober about how understanding about all of human patterns where we're heading toward, where the devil is trying to destroy everything with his one world government, Christianity falling apart, but Christianity being saved thanks to a godly heritage and great awakening revival preaching. Uh, Lord, that's what everybody needs. That's what this country needs is preaching. That's what's going to save the country, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.